funding to integrate the material that they got from Monroe and some other recent stuff that came from the Gulf of Mexico dead zone and Africa and a few other like trips. So they're in the process of going through and completely re-adding material to the collection. So it's going to take a long time, but multiple buildings. So right now we're going to the only building that's pretty close to like <laughs> normal. <laughs> So you'll see, there's like, yeah, it's like the other buildings are like literally like boxes of specimens on the floor. And even in here, there's some because everything's being moved around and reshuffled. And then this um, collection is in uh, taxonomic order. So um, looking at the taxonomy, and that's changing all the time, especially with genetics. So in the past, it was largely based on shape and the way that we identified species from the kind of 19th century model. But all that's changed because of molecular stuff. So we're trying to figure out ways to integrate the two areas of science together. <laughs> um, okay, well let's just let's just go swimming and see. Jump in. Sweet. Oh, black forehead. So that's new. That's new. That's for today. This is cool. This is cool. Oh my gosh. What's the coolest thing ever? That's his nose? Bro, what is yeah. that? It's a paddlefish. They use that for buoyancy, they swim in rivers, and they open their mouth like a basking shark, and they filter feed. Oh, so the so the paddle's actually for... Yeah, navigating moving water to help them. Because, yeah, not a defensive thing, not like a... Um, Sawfish. I was thought I always thought it was for like some type of like sensing. Sensing. I always hear that it's like an electrical sensing or something. Well, or something there's, like there's that. hammerhead charts. Possibility because a lot of fish are electric and uh, they have an electric field around them, so they can feel so heightened sense of you know all these. Things. Yeah. All right, um, but I don't know how much of that, it's not like an electric eel where they're sending out a charge, yeah. that feeling. Yeah. But, oh yeah. No, oh, yeah, just. Okay, guys, um, so this is the majority of the collection, but it's the newer, like younger species. Unfortunately, the more primitive stuff like sharks and lamprey and eels, um, cartilaginous fish are in another building, but that building is like, not accessible right now. There are jars everywhere because we're doing black mold, um, fixing it for black mold, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, not easy to get into. So uh, you'll see a lot of the, this group called Cyprinidae. Um, that's probably the largest group of freshwater fish in the world. Cyprinidae are lots and lots of the minnows. Um, they got Royal Sutkiss. He collected over a million individual um, samples of one species but he kept doing it year after year, and that's how we got a million of them. And few, people have suggested, like, isn't that excessive? <laughs> but the, the nice thing about it is it reflects what he found, which is kind of a neat way to look at it. They're still, today, if you go seining, one of the most common fish you're gonna find in streams around here. So it's called like a spotted chub. And, um, and they're just like super, super common. Neutrophus is the, is the genus. Um, the other thing is, the nice thing about having a million specimens is if we're contacted by another organization that wants to come in and do some kind of analysis and dissect the fish, we say, yeah, you can have a few hundred. So they're using that to <laughs> take, take a few yeah, thousand. Yeah. Word, yeah. Yep. So they're using those fish now to do a microplastic study. Oh, cool. So what they're able to see is like basically from the 60s, 70s, 80s, oh 90s, there's no microplastics and then suddenly, boom. 
you know, and that's from going through all those. So it's it's nice to have that. I mean, I think the things have changed with natural history collection and biology in general. We tend to collect a lot less than the people that went in front of us, in part because there is less. And it's also increasingly expensive to maintain their collection, like collections like this, because one, they're flammable. So you don't really want this like, you know, under your present, you know, your dean's building in case it catches on fire and explodes. The Smithsonian actually moved theirs outside of Washington, DC for security reasons. Um, these are perfect because they're designed if there's a fire and explosion. I mean, this is designed to, for an explosion. <laughs> so this, these are pieces of wood um, that are embedded in the walls. And essentially what would happen is if an ammunition had would have gone off, this front wall would have just flown off structure itself would have been intact um, so and it is relatively climate controlled it, it's about 60 degrees 60 something year round on its own um, so if we want to kind of just look around at some of them um, if we go that way you can go down the aisles and take pictures and see everything so there's lots of different diversity so once you get out of cycling today things start to look really good there you go, dude.